You lost both teams? Get a grip on this operation, Heather. That's boring. Green light the asset. Sir, I need more time. We have no time. Are you going to give that order or not? Sir, please. You are too naive to see the truth. There's no bringing in Bourne. He has to be put down. And you obviously cannot do what... We will defend these police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to pick the law. We enforce them. But at the end of the day, each and every member is to go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous crime. Nonpartisan liberty for all. I am your host, Dave Bourne, and it is September 14th. 2016 and we are coming to you live from las vegas nevada thank you for tuning in to nonpartisan liberty for all we're on weeknights tuesday through thursday at seven o'clock pacific ten o'clock eastern and you can listen live on spreaker.com and nonpartisan liberty for all.com and to the archives immediately following the show on spreaker youtube twitter tumblr soundcloud stitcher and itunes on nonpartisan liberty for all we promote Self-ownership and the ideas of true freedom and liberty, meaning being able to do whatever you want as long as you respect the freedom of others and don't directly interfere with their freedom. Exposing government for what it is, a mafia based on extortion that rules without consent by threat of force and violence. Something that somebody had brought up to me it was actually Ken Shorjan when he was on He did bring up the point when I said that all uh, I didn't say all laws are backed by force because that is 100 percent. But that government, when I said that government is backed by force, he uh, said, well, not necessarily because it's also or it rules by force that it can rule by things like giving out free money and brainwashing and stuff like that. So, okay, yes, that is true, but ultimately it rules by the barrel of a gun because if that doesn't work, that's the backup. That's the ultimate uh, way that they rule people. So, And every law is backed by force, no matter what the law is. It doesn't have to be a criminal law, as people saw uh Corinne Gaines getting a ticket and she ended up getting killed later and plenty of people have been pulled over and have been killed for ridiculous reasons that the police of course defend because they defend themselves no matter what they do because they're a bunch of fucking lying murdering fucking pigs I guess that's where they got that from and I I know that not only from research and things like that uh and stories and uh, articles, but also from my own experience, unfortunately. But anyway, we're happy to hear from you. You can reach us via phone at 702-470-7664. That's 702-470-7664. Or via Skype at Nonpartisan Liberty for All. And check us out at nonpartisanlibertyforall.com, which links to our Facebook and social media info as well as our contact information and more. So be sure to like us on Facebook. Uh, We have about four Facebook pages and follow us on Twitter. Also, we have various articles and blogs. Uh, I need to uh, catch up on that. I do have uh, an article I was working on Saturday night till like six in the morning and it's pages and pages that need to be edited and, I I want my articles to be as professional as possible. Um, Technically, I've never been paid for writing, but I did go to school 
for film and I had to write a whole screenplay and I took various screenwriting classes, not writing writing classes, but it's actually harder to write a screenplay in some ways because you have to the show not tell idea where you have to show it instead of unless you have a narrator and my uh professor hated narrators she was actually a screenwriter because she thought it made it a lot easier not to say that there's not a lot of great movies that have narrators right away goodfellas and casino come to mind but it what it does is it allows the screenwriter to express all these ideas without having to show them. So it makes it easier where screenwriting is actually harder. But anyway, I also took a journalism class in uh, my first couple years of college. I went to community college and then uh, transferred. So anyway, uh, I want to make sure that the articles are as good as possible or at least passable <laughs> just because of juggling all of this stuff uh on this on the other side of that I want to get them out there so I don't want to spend too much time going over them it's like yes I want them to be to a certain standard but I don't want to spend all this time on um that uh standard so anyway tonight we're going to talk actually for the next two nights we're going to talk all about the iran contra uh affair if you want to call it that that's what they used to call it as well as something that a lot of people don't know about especially younger people they might not even know about the iran contra affair but Mina, Arkansas, and went went on there, uh, and what that airport, it was mainly the airport uh, that we're concerned with and what was going on. And the governor at the time was none other than uh, former President uh, Bill uh, Clinton. So he comes into this. There, there are so many different parts to this whole thing because you have i mean and all of it is government doing illegal shit and you know some of the stuff that they did i don't necessarily disagree with except for the hypocrisy so you have in the 80s of course the you know what reagan did to this country and what he did regarding the drug war. I mean, we're still feeling the effects of that. And at the same time, the CIA was bringing in planefuls of cocaine and selling it really to get the profits. And that's not the first time that they've done that. So we're going to talk all about that the next two days get into as much detail as possible. And for people who aren't aware of what went on there, and I, I, you know, I was aware of the Iran-Contra stuff because I was a little kid at the time, and I remember seeing the um, the hearings that they had in front of Congress. And... During those hearings, you know, the lies basically that came out and, well, I think they were half truths to some people like Oliver North and because he pretty much said, you know, this is what we did. Of course, he left out the drug part that was heavily left out and Reagan, I have no recollections. Um, so... Um, I'm trying to actually type a message while I'm on the air, which is never a good idea. Uh, for me, although, as I always say, I'm a good, uh, multitasker, but
Um, I, for some reason, I can't do stuff like that. It's like part of my brain that multitasks with that. I can't do when it's computer stuff and go from this screen to that screen and working on this to that. I can do all that stuff fine. But when it comes to talking and trying to focus on something else, all my focus has to be on what I'm saying. Um, so anyway, let's get right into this because we don't really have a lot of time to talk about anything else. So pretty much the next two days is going to be all Iran Contra and, uh, the CIA selling drugs, Bill Clinton and what went on in Arkansas. And it, it might sound like something that is not that interesting, but believe me, it's it's pretty, even from an entertainment standpoint, uh, it's pretty interesting. And there's a lot of stuff that people don't know about. So I, of course, suggest you listen to both days, but, uh, you know, that that is up to you uh, whether or not this is something that interests you. One thing I, I have to mention, because I should have mentioned it yesterday, but I had forgotten, even though I remembered a couple days before. Yesterday was the 20th anniversary of Tupac's death. Um, he had died on Friday the 13th, and I had actually remembered that in 1996. He would have been uh, 45 years old. He would have turned 45 in June, and I was a big uh, fan um, of Tupac, and I was actually around when he was alive. <laughs> so I was a fan when he was alive. There's a lot of kids, which is fine. Uh, but you know, I had his first, uh, CD or at the time tapes. Cause all I had was tapes, but I had his first tape, uh, that came out in 91 to apocalypse now. And I remember, uh, not all eyes on me, but me against the world and the, at the time, the things going on in my life and how I could relate a lot to that album. Cause a lot of it was about, um, there were some songs about depression and just deep shit. And, um, there were a lot of things going on at the time. Um, I think when it first came out, I might've even been on probation anyway. Um, I just want to mention that and the impact that Tupac has had on so many people's lives and the influence in society. And if you listen, I, I know people, you know, just hear the interviews that are you know, about gangster shit or whatever, or though they just hear those songs. But if you listen to a lot of the stuff, he didn't focus on all eyes on me was more focused on, I think a certain, uh, more of a hardcore kind of feel to it, but not that everything he did wasn't hardcore. It was, but everything else was a lot deeper and had a lot more meaning, I think, than All Eyes on Me. Although it was a great album, there were a lot of just hardcore kind of jams on it or, uh, you know, dance stuff or whatever, like How Do You Want It or um, Two of America's Most Wanted or stuff like that. And he had a couple of songs on there that were deeper, but uh, on all his other albums, he showed, uh, especially me against the world, but even to apocalypse now and ha um, the one with holler, if you hear me, um, I can't think of the oh, strictly for my niggas. Uh, he balanced everything out. And that's at the time I actually rapped, I did a CD just on my own four track. Nobody heard it. It was, you know, whatever, but that's how I was as far as showing all aspects to my personality and nobody's hard 24 seven. And I would always say that back then, um, that you might have that tough, 
uh, aspect to you. But at the same time, it's not, you know, all of you. And you have th- these rappers that that's all. I mean, rap has become uh, a lot of it is garbage now as far as the meaning and what people rap about. Whereas, you know, I heard somebody say something about NWA's fuck the police and how they insulted it and whatnot. But they were, I mean, they had to be in their early 20s or mid 20s. So they they don't know what was going on at the time. I mean, for something like that to come out, it was a uh, statement against society, against the government, against, and, and that's rap meant a lot more, and it had a lot more meaning, even in the stuff that you would be labeled gangster shit. So I did a show on my, you know, kind of my history of rap. You can find it in the archives. It actually got a lot of listens. I was surprised. And I played some clips and and maybe we'll do another one because I have so much knowledge of, you know, rap from the late 80s all the way until probably mid 2000s or, you know, later. Uh, I don't know what you'd call the first decade of the 2000s, the O's. <laughs> But, you know, the last maybe six, seven, eight, nine years, um, I kind of trailed off with new artists because it's just a lot of it's garbage. I still listen to if an older artist comes out with something, you know, that I'm a fan of, like Scarface came out with a new CD last year, and and I, I got that. I usually get stuff from the library. We have a great library system in Nevada. That's one thing I'll give to government, the library system. However, you know, I wouldn't mind paying, you know, 20 bucks a month to be a member of the library. I'd have no problem, um, you know. So I think the library, like anything else, could be a for-profit system and still operate Uh, how it does. Um, But it's one of the few things that I think uh, have been set up very well, at least in Las Vegas. I can't speak to other cities, but I'm assuming, you know, that the model must be similar, at least I would hope. So anyway, I don't want to waste any more time on that. Um, so as I we was saying, I remember as a kid seeing the hearings, and I remember back then, I don't know what year it was. It might have been years after it happened, but it was definitely in the 80s. It might have been the late 80s. But even then, them saying that they were flying back planefuls of cocaine. And you have this president that, was persecuting everybody who did any kind of drug. And, I mean, he was out of his fucking mind when it came to drugs. I mean, in all seriousness, Reagan was, it was just insane, his war on drugs. And you have the government flying in all this cocaine so the CIA can generate money, and we'll get into that, and and not the first time um, that they have done that, and who knows how far back they go, but uh, there's at least one other pre- prior occasion that I'm aware of. And then, you know, they say, one of the other things I noticed looking at, uh, I watched a lot of documentaries and videos, and one of the things I noticed a lot of people saying is that, well, if things don't change, you know, it's the end of the country and the Constitution is gone and the institution of government is it's over and all of these things. And they say all the same things today. You know, all the things that they were saying in fucking you know, 30 years ago, 
literally. And that's a pretty long time. I mean, not in terms of, you know, other things, but when you're talking about, you know, government and them saying something like that 30 years ago and nothing's changed except for the fact that things have gotten worse, that more and more freedoms have been taken away. But you still have people that say the same shit regarding, um, well, if we just get the right person in there. And they've been saying that shit as well for more than, you know, who knows how long, you know, and something like this, what did it really, what effect did it really have? You know, none. I mean, things just went on. That's the problem. That's why I don't believe in government, among other reasons, is You know, it's the institution that is the problem. The names don't matter. It doesn't matter who's in there. It doesn't matter. You know, it's going to be different names and different faces, but the outcome is going to stay the same. And as I have said, I believe from the beginning, you know, you start at a certain point like a race and they started at the starting point and They slowly kept going forward and forward. And that's why, you know, people that say, well, this started with George Bush or, you know, George Bush uh, Jr. Or it started with Obama. And people forget about things like the Iran-Contra or MKUltra in the 50s. Or, I mean, I could go through history and I should do a show on this. Probably going back to the Whiskey Rebellion and starting there or even right before that, where the elite overthrew the government that they just installed, essentially, with the Articles of Confederation. And I need to get more information on that. I, I'm limited in my information on how uh, that transition took place. But I do know that they overthrew their own government that they created in the first place. So... I mean, that alone brings me to the conclusion that and they wanted more because they wanted more power. They wanted a stronger central government. Now, think about that for a minute. They wanted a stronger central government. So they wanted more power. They wanted more control. And they got as much control as they could at the time that the people would take, that the people would stand for, essentially. Right. So when you look at that. Because they had a lot less power back then. They didn't have the technology. They didn't have a standing army. They didn't have all of these things where they could take too much power. And maybe people, there were a few of them, uh, like Washington, they wanted to be a king and he refused and he only stayed two terms. I mean, it's hard to really say when you look at history because... You can take an event and totally manipulate the presentation of that event to influence the conclusion. So you can look at it as a bunch of elites essentially said, we don't want a king. We want to run shit and we're going to take as much power as we can and only take it you know, to a certain point where people aren't going to want to rebel and then we'll slowly take more and more power over generations and generations. And that's what has happened. And that's why when, you know, I hear people talking about, uh, yesterday I talked a little about racism and some of the ridiculous things that people were saying, like this woman that, I mean, it's her right and opinion uh, that was uh, putting down uh, black men that date white women and how white women are evil and all this shit and, and did another video that basically said, you know, if black people don't have jobs, it's because of white people. And like, there's a whole big conspiracy that all white people are out to get black people or something. Now, 
if you want to tell me the elite that are basically running things that's in their agenda, um, it may be. I don't know that it is. I think they have more important things that they want to take over everything. But I, I it's not something that's impossible. That's definitely a possibility. But the whole, uh, you know, it's all white people as a whole. And to make statements like that is is ridiculous. And they don't see or care about the oppression of everybody. And that's where I care about and why I do the show is, I said this yesterday, that it's about freedom for all people. And I mean all people. And the Constitution didn't care about all people neither. And let's not forget that. They didn't care about women. They didn't care about black people. I don't know, you know, they were wiping out Native Americans now, you could say, well, if they didn't do that, then the country wouldn't be what it is and all of this shit and whatever. There were probably other ways to do things than how they did them. As far as owning land, that's a whole nother issue. Um, I don't know... The Indians were, or Native Americans were more like nomadic, as were Muslims uh, back in the day, um, for the most part. So, I, I have issues when it comes to property. I believe in private property, definitely, and especially, you know, your items like your car or your whatever you own. But when it comes to land, um, I believe you can own land, but that gets a little... I don't want to get into a long conversation on this because it's just taking away from all this stuff I have to say, but it land is a little different. And I believe in the ownership of land, and if it's your property, then it's your property, and you have the right to do what you want with your property. But when you think of like people are born onto the earth and properties based on what really at this point of who went and said, this is mine first and actually, you know, created some fucking deed or something like that or marked it as their territory. Because essentially all the land that the U.S. government claims to own I don't recognize that. So I can go to the desert and say, this is my fucking land as far as I'm concerned. And why shouldn't I be able to? So that's a whole nother issue. Anyway, um, the part that was important here is that the institution of government is the issue. And the people have been saying the same things over and over again, yet they expect a change. Now everybody's on Trump and Trump's the savior and Trump's going to do this. And no, it's going to be the same thing all over again. The plan that the powers that be have is going to continue on and people are just going to sit there and do nothing. And until they meet your, I talked about drawing a line in the sand and until they meet that line. But for most people, it will be too late. So Anyway, let's get to the CIA selling drugs. Now, the CIA has been selling drugs. Now, don't forget, the CIA came after World War II. They had another agency. I think it was the SOS or something uh, that was similar to the CIA. But they've at least been selling drugs since the Vietnam War, which would only be you know, about 15 to 20 years into the CIA. And one of the reasons that they got into drug sales is, and this is, 
I got this information from other people as well, but is this really, can you really confirm that this is the reason why? Um, you can speculate, and I think there's enough information that points to this, and I would say that I uh, agree with it, that you know they get their own budget, but at the same time, they do all of these things on their own, all these covert ops and all of this other stuff, and they need money to do it. And I think drug sales uh, were an income stream for the CIA to be able to have all this money that wasn't on the books, that they could do whatever the fuck they want. And then, of course, you have, you know, Rumsfeld of the, at the time, the Secretary of Defense, and I don't know how much of that would go to the CIA. Um, maybe none of it may, but um, I would think State Department money would go to the CIA, but maybe both. I don't know exactly how they work because they secretly keep so many things from people. But the day before 9-11, um, he announced that three trillion dollars, which right now is what, like a third of the debt? No, more like a seventh of the debt because it's at like twenty million dollars. Uh, but three trillion dollars is a lot of money. That's like a couple trillion short of the budget each year, the yearly budget, which is insane how the federal government can have a budget of over $4 trillion each year, but that's another issue. So they started in, and there are movies on this, um, Air America, go watch the movie Air America. I didn't see the whole thing, but it's in Vietnam and, and in Laos and the countries uh, surrounding there, they were producing heroin and then bringing it into the U.S. And in Lethal Weapon as well, two Mel Gibson movies, I guess he was uh, right about one thing or trying to expose one thing um, about the government because he did two movies that really exposed... And I think Air America is what they called it because I heard in some of these uh, documentaries, uh, one of the CIA guys referred to doing things with Air America in Vietnam. And right there, it makes me think that he was involved with drugs there, too, because he also was involved with Iran-Contra. Now, he, this is a guy that I'll get to later that was a whistleblower and claims he didn't know anything about the drug part. And when he found out, he tried to leave. And then he, I, he was like a wanted criminal. Um, and that's a whole nother story that hopefully we'll be able to get into. So, but being that he said he was involved with Air America makes me think, well, okay, you're involved in two things that had to do with drugs, uh, unless you're stupid. Uh, I mean, I don't know. So in Lethal Weapon, it was, they mentioned Air America, and they said in Vietnam, I got involved. If you've seen the first Lethal Weapon movie, if you remember uh, Danny Glover's friend whose daughter was killed, and then when he was telling them, um, they shot him through uh, a milk carton um, from a helicopter. And he told them that they were bringing in shipments of heroin because after uh, the, the war was over, they still had their contacts and they were bringing in two shipments a year of heroin. So they were doing that. And then later, of course, what's going on in Afghanistan now with the opium production and how much it's up now, who profits from that, I don't know. But if you look at the past, uh, the CIA, I would assume, is getting a percentage of that money, if not all of it. And 
you know, with opium, the thing is that they can get away with saying because th- there's not that I'm aware of, although there might be evidence out there with what uh, Bradley Manning released, but that they're actually manufacturing heroin because opium, you could say, well, yes, we're importing opium because we need opium for things like, uh, you know, all the different painkillers that require opium. Although at the same time, they're cracking down on those. So either way you want to look at it, they're bringing in all this opium or heroin if they're converting it to heroin, which is worse. And then they're saying, um, you know, oh, but we're going to go after these. And then they go after things like Crotum, where uh, I did a show on it. There's a, for, for people that don't know, I'll, I'll just briefly uh, mention Crotum. It's a plant that grows mainly in Thailand, but also Indonesia and some of the nations around uh, that area, place, basically same places as opium. And it has two chemicals in it that if... Uh, different types it's kind of like marijuana now or cannabis now that different types have different effects but if you initially it's kind of a stimulant but if you take a, more it has an opium like effect it is not an opioid um but it does help people with opium withdrawal and the DA, dea as of september 30th has uh put it as a schedule 1 drug right now it's totally legal and you can buy it smoke shops and you can order on the internet. So they're, it, it's just ridiculous. They're total contradictions of themselves. It's control. I mean, they want to control everything. It, they said it's a temporary schedule one, meaning they're going to study it for a couple years and see if there's any uses. Now, since it's a plant, there's not much money anybody can make off it except, you know, independent uh, sellers, which is anybody that can get their hands on it or get it imported, which is pretty much um, barriers to entry uh, for a business like that, I don't think are many. And with all the technology, I'm sure that if you put all this money into um, you know, building some kind of greenhouse or indoor greenhouse, um, that you could probably grow it yourself, but I don't know enough about that to say. But it would take people away from other stuff that pharmaceutical companies produce. Although, when it comes to painkillers, there's no more patents on them. They're not that much money. You know, this whole thing that pharmaceutical companies make so much money off them, and that's why they prescribe them. I don't think it's the case because they're totally cracking down on them. Some doctors won't even prescribe them. And they might because of the volume, just because there's so many prescriptions uh, that are going out. But again, they're trying to lower that. But it's the SSRIs. They're pushing those like a motherfucker. You don't see commercials for painkillers, okay? You see a commercial for every goddamn SSRI that comes out, and they keep coming out with new ones. How many do you fucking need? And these are like experimental chemicals. At least, um, you know, things like uh, hydrocortone and oxy are from opiates. They're from plants. Now, they're extracting chemicals from them and using chemicals, sorry, to extract certain parts of them. But either way... um, you know, it's I don't believe it's as bad as people want to make it out to be. The only thing that makes it bad is the fact that if you can't get a prescription, you have to buy it on the street, which costs a lot of money. And then you run out of money. And then if you're addicted to it and can't get it, you go through withdrawal. But if you could get it and buy it at the store, there would be no fucking problems. I mean, there there would be some people with problems, you know, just like any anything else, but the amount of problems would go way, way down, the amount of issues. Plus, I believe the amount of heroin users, which uh, Kratom also uh, helps as well. 
uh, would go down. So they want to take, of course, a drug that's helping people and schedule one it because the volume is increasing to a level that it might cut into their control or their money. And they want people going to rehabs. They want doctors to have control over people because the government has control over doctors. So, and again, that's a whole nother thing. Um, the CIA has overthrown so many governments. Um, I was watching some documentary where they were just naming off so many, um, you know, governments. Uh, Chile is one of the governments they overthrow through, of course. I, I, Iran, um, they installed the Shah of Iran. There's just so many. And it's how they fight wars without fighting wars. It's how they build their empire. And as I've said before, the United States is so good at doing things in a way to create an illusion of whatever they want to create. Just like they don't come out as a dictatorship, but the things that they do, a lot of them are almost acts of a dictator in a way. The way they, you know, they might as well be with uh, the way they create laws and install whatever, um, you know, in the Senate and House of Representatives, the way that is totally controlled, the, the way the presidential elections are totally controlled. I mean, it's all controlled. So they might as well be uh, a dictatorship. There was a study in the BBC. Uh, there was an article that the U.S. is now an oligarchy. So, you know, and most of these people don't even have that much power, neither. It's the corporations the billionaires, a lot of them that we don't even know their names. Um, and, you know, the people that are part of some of these groups, like the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations. And you can't tell me that the Council on Foreign Relations doesn't have control over anything because you have people like Hillary that was there a couple months ago. Why? They're not part of the government. It's like if me and a bunch of people got together and said, we're going to create this organization that talks about policy and we're going to use our connections to government to get them to implement our policies or listen to us or whatever. Um, it, it's kind of crazy because to become a member, it's, you know, it's the elite is what it is. So, um, you know, the CIA essentially fought against and continues to fight against any country that doesn't support U.S. foreign policy or gets in the way of the petrodollar um, because that gets destroyed. The dollar falls apart. So a lot of basically anything that happens in the Middle East is over that, regardless of what people say Um you know, maybe not every 100%, but the majority. So um, somebody also made a statement that the reason for the drug war was so the CIA could sell all these drugs, which really, I have to have them explain that because that really makes no sense. Whether there's a drug war or not, I guess the making sure they're illegal because that ups the price. So if that was their uh, rationale in saying that um, and they got that information from sources, but that they started to drug war so the government could make more money off drugs. And I guess having a drug war and upping the amount of law enforcement that goes after drugs would essentially up the price of drugs because the risk goes up. It goes way up. You know, if there's no drug war, but it's still illegal, but they're not, you know, really going after it, then the price would probably drop. If you're because if you're if you're missing 
you know, you're shipping drugs in from another country and every spot it goes, the price goes up. You know, if you're if if you somehow buy drugs in Colombia, if you're buying cocaine and you get cocaine out of Colombia, although they're not the ones that are, you know, the big Colombian cartels, um, as far as I know, are non-existent at this point. It's all the Mexican cartels. But as far as I know, it would still be produced in Peru, Bolivia, and Colombia. So say you get it where they grow it, you know, you're going to pay hardly anything for it. I think the price, you know, I, I watched a, a documentary where it went through, okay, here the price is this, then when it gets to here, it goes to this. Now, if you're losing you know, a certain amount of loads or whatever, or even say the Mexican cartels getting it into the United States that the DEA is seizing a certain amount, the price goes up as well. So uh, that would obviously help the dealers because the price, I mean, even though they're losing it, you know, the price is at a certain amount because of that so because of the not only the risk but the fact that you got to build into the price the fact that you might lose a certain amount of product it's just like a store that builds in you know uh theft into the price and knows that we're going to lose this amount you know and based on that we're going to put the price at this so it's a factor So I want to go back to the beginning of really where this started and try to get into as much detail as I can um, with this, because it really goes back to, um, so there's two things going on, of course, there, the civil and, and right around the same time, well, actually we'll say three things because you have Iran and what's going on there you have the election with Reagan and, and Carter going on in uh 1980 November of it would have been November 1980 Reagan taking office in eight, January of 81 and the civil war in Nicaragua uh starting around 79 80 or around the same time And also you have the ousting of the Shah of Iran and the seizing of the U.S. embassy. So if you have seen the movie Argo with Ben Affleck, uh, that as far as I know, I mean, not everything was true. Remember, when you watch a movie about a true subject, unless it's a documentary, it's not going to be 100 percent. But the whole idea of Iran took over the U.S. embassy, that happened, and they took hostages. And in the movie, it was about the ones that actually got out, which was, I think, something between 10 and 8, and then they, you know, I I don't know exactly what happened with them getting them out. They, They had mentioned that, oh, well, they changed this, or they changed that, or whatever, but But, yeah, they did get out, like, those 10 or 8 hostages. But the rest were still there, I believe, in the embassy, or they might have took them someplace else. I don't know. And I'm not sure of the number, but it's got to be between 80 and 100 or 150. Not 150, but 100, between 100 and 5-0 like in between there somewhere. So Carter, of course, was trying to negotiate to get the hostages, the rest of them, besides the, you know, the ones that had escaped and and got out. So we'll, uh, I guess, start with that. And you have the um presidential election going on at the same time you know carter didn't have a good presidency there were lines from what i understand for oil that doesn't necessarily mean that was his fault but he was not a good president 
economically. He did a lot of damage when it came to the economy. Now, how much him getting the hostages out would have influenced the election, I I don't know. I have no idea. If he would have got them out, would he, he have won the election? Probably, I would think probably not because I think people wanted change because of uh, what was going on economically. And it's the same thing. It's all a big circle. It's Republican to Democrat. Eventually people, you know, want to change. But it's the same thing over and over again. They're all the same. And, And like I said, I mean, you can go back to the Reagan years and what they were saying. You can probably go back to you know, 50 years and what people were saying. It's just the ignorance of people is just unbelievable. And I say ignorance because ignorance doesn't mean you're stupid. Um, It just means it's like they're unaware that they're being they've been brainwashed into this cycle that they just can't get out of it. This is how it is. This is the system and that's it. And you just uh, live with the system and how it is. And nobody thinks outside the fucking box anymore. So you had the election going on. You had Iran holding hostages Now, at the same time, you had the Sandinistas who, from what I understand, they ousted whoever was in power at that time. I'm not sure of the the specific uh, who was the president that they ousted, but the Sandinistas were were a communist uh, regime. So they took over Nicaragua. Uh, around 1980 and were running it. And a lot of people that actually were involved in taking over and in the Sandinistan government or supporters ended up joining the Contras because it wasn't what they thought it was going to be. Although the Contras had killed, uh, you know, innocent People had went to villages and murdered people and done a lot of fucked up things. Now, they seem to be totally controlled by the CIA, but that's we'll get to that. Um, So you have these things going on. So what happened was and Reagan actually admitted it, although the way he admitted it was like, I didn't know this, but. It seems that I've become aware that this happened. Like, he didn't have anything to do with it. Don't forget that Ronald Reagan was a fucking actor. And it's sickening that you have all these conservatives um, saying how great Reagan was. And, you know, you can take some speeches and some lines that he said, like, you know, uh, that government is the problem. Uh, line I forget the whole thing um it's only like two sentences but it's it's something that you know about not needing more government and that government is the problem um and there's some other lines from Reagan that you can take all that means is he was a good actor and he had good speech writers. That doesn't mean anything. And people remember Reagan because of the relationship with the Soviet Union. He pretty much, besides Grenada, didn't go to a quote-unquote war or wasn't in a war. But he was. He, it was all covert operations, a lot of them, and a lot of them that were probably still unaware of. So he was that type of guy. And remember, his vice president used to be the head of the CIA. So 
he believed in all of that because Jimmy Carter got rid of a, a bunch of people that were in the CIA. And from what I understand, Reagan brought, I don't know if he brought all the specific people back, but he brought those positions back. So he supported all that shit. So instead of, you know, he did the empire building. He just didn't, you know, he did it in a way that was smart. He didn't let people see it. He did it behind their backs and continued to build the U.S. empire. And, you know, during his time in office, like I said, technically there weren't any wars. Like I said, I know they invaded Grenada. I have no idea why. Uh, I have heard that it, it had something to do with uh, to get whatever was uh, in the news the day before, you know, that type of thing to get the uh, – that's what actually a – teacher in college had said uh, my journalism teacher was I look at the day before Grenada was uh, uh, invaded and uh, you'll know why they invaded Grenada it was like a one day or two day operation or something but they they think of him for that as a negotiator or whatever but when it comes to quote unquote conservative values if they're so against the immigration he gave um what do you call it? Amnesty, um, which I'm fine with, but uh, I don't know how conservatives are fine with. He had the whole Iran Contra thing, which he, technically, I mean, he could have got impeached for that. Um, not to mention the fact that he was a hypocrite. He started the war on drugs. He ruined people's lives. I mean, there's so many things that have happened. You should read the book. Uh, the Rise of the Warrior Cup by Radley Balco, and I always bring that up because it talks about the drug war was a was a major cause of uh, a lot of the militarization and the no knock warrants and the going to the wrong houses and shooting little girls and uh, one time they even went to a mayor's house and killed his dog because they got wrong information and just taking any snitches information of what they said, because any arrest they got, they got money out of it. They got, you know, credit for the arrest. It was just ridiculous. And it still goes on is the whole thing. And not only that is it took freedom. And I did a show on this. It, it didn't just affect the drug war does not just affect drug users or drug dealers. It affects your average person because you look at how many people who have been harassed by the police or uh, a perfect example. And if this was an isolated incident, it wouldn't be as bad, but it'd still be pretty bad. But I mean, things like this happen all the time that the two women that were people probably heard about this in Texas were cavity searched on the side of the road, both uh, orifices, because the police claim they smell marijuana even though they couldn't find any of it. So you look at things like that, or it gives them a reason to search your car or search your house or search whatever, because they could say, well, what if there's drugs there? Because the only thing that cops search for are drugs or weapons. Besides that, what else is there? So, and that's why I think they're so closely related and, and it bothers me, the people that think all drugs should be legal but want to ban guns and vice versa. Um, the people that are big gun enthusiasts that want drugs to remain um, illegal and you have a lot of those people as well. So you have all these things kind of coming together and what had happened is I know Bush was at this meeting and this guy Bonifar among other people. And, and the guy Bonifar is important because he later is involved in the Iran Contra uh, thing. So 
Iran wanted weapons because they were at a like ten year war with Iraq. I, I don't know if they were had been at war that long yet, but they they were at war with Iraq for a long time. Um, I'm not sure on the specifics when it started, but they must have been at war with Iraq at the time, and they wanted weapons. So supposedly. Reagan was not there, but Bush was there, uh, again, among other people. And they said, if you hold the hostages until Reagan gets elected, we will sell you weapons. So you need weapons to fight against uh, Iraq. We'll, We'll supply you those weapons. We'll sell them to you, but, you know, we'll supply you with weapons. So they did hold the hostages. Reagan becomes president. They release the hostages. Of course, he looks great. And also Jimmy Carter looks, you know, bad. So it's coming up to election day and they're still holding the hostages. So they held him. I think it was a couple of years while he was president or at least a year, a year and a half. So you have that. Then you have the Sandinistas and the communist policy also that Reagan, who actually snitched in the 50s, testified at the McCarthy hearings and, you know, where they'd ask people, are you a member of the Communist Party? People forget about shit like that, too. That's that's freedom where you blacklist people and some people went to jail over it because they wouldn't answer the question, which they have a right not to. Uh, But the people that did were essentially blacklisted from Hollywood um, because they were a member of the communist party in the thirties. It was ridiculous. And Reagan, of course, was one of the guys that, you know, came up and testified and snitched on and, you know, all his friends and whatever. And he's also the guy who, you know, despite supposedly supporting gun rights, um, it might have been open carry that he banned because of the Black Panthers and their ability to walk around with guns. So I believe it was something like open carry. You know, he restricted guns in California when he was governor of California. So people forget about that as well. But you have this war going on. You have, well, not even a war. You have the Sandinistas kind of took over. Then you have all these groups. There were fragmented groups, rebel groups, I guess you would call them, a whole bunch of them, until the government got involved, which initially Congress supported up until 1984. So we're going to take a quick break. Um, I have some clips to play. And when we get back, I'll start getting into that. And then we'll start to get into some really interesting and corrupt shit. Um, which ends up with, you know, governors laundering money, uh, kids being murdered for what they saw, among other people trying to investigate stuff being murdered. I think eight people in total that uh, I'm aware of were murdered for looking into things in Arkansas. Um, There's a lot of stuff that uh, had went on. So, We will be right back after this nonpartisan liberty for all. Be sure to go to the website and check us out. And remember that we're we're doing uh, a two day special on this because there is so much uh, information on it. So. 
we're doing a two day special. So be sure to tune in to both days because I think tomorrow will get more interesting, but um, we're still not done with today. So, and of course, if you'd like to call in, if you have any comments, um, feel free 702-470-7664 or Skype in username, nonpartisan Liberty for all. Of course, if you forget any of that information, you can get all that at nonpartisanlibertyforall.com, all our contact information. So we will be right back after this. And there's some important clips on here. Actually, I want to mention after the show, I'll also be playing some of the documentaries. Um, so if you want to listen to those uh, stay tuned and I will loop those actually. I probably, I might just put them on a loop until tomorrow. Um, so I figured out how to do that. So I, there's about four or five of them. Um, so you can turn tune in at your convenience over the next, you know, uh, from when the show ends until when the show starts tomorrow, um, to check those out. So, We'll be right back after this. Nonpartisan Liberty for all dot com. Live from Las Vegas. I am the born identity. <laughs> Dave Bourne. We'll be right back. Are you looking for a podcast that talks about life, the universe, and everything? Listen in to the Illumination Hour, Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. Listen live at Spreaker.com or NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com. We're also on SoundCloud, Spreaker, Twitter, Tumblr, YouTube, and iTunes. The Illumination Hour, brought to you by Nonpartisan Liberty For All Media and Radio Network. And your host, Ellen Stallone. Because a spark can illuminate the world. My fellow Americans, I have spoken to you from this historic office on many occasions and about many things. The power of the presidency is often thought to reside within this Oval Office. Yet it doesn't rest here. It rests in you, the American people, and in your trust. Your trust is what gives a president his powers of leadership and his personal strength. And it's what I want to talk to you about this evening. For the past three months, I've been silent on the revelations about Iran. And you must have been thinking, well, why doesn't he tell us what's happening? Why doesn't he just speak to us as he has in the past when we've faced troubles or tragedies? Others of you, I guess, were thinking, what's he doing hiding out in the White House? Well, the reason I haven't spoken to you before now is this. You deserve the truth. And as frustrating as the waiting has been, I felt it was improper to come to you with sketchy reports or possibly even erroneous statements, which would then have to be corrected, creating even more doubt and confusion. There's been enough of that. I paid a price for my silence in terms of your trust and confidence, but I've had to wait as you have, for the complete story. That's why I appointed Ambassador David Abshire as my special counselor to help get out the thousands of documents to the various investigations. And I appointed a special review board, the Tower Board, which took on the chore of pulling the truth together for me and getting to the bottom of things. It has now issued its findings. I'm often accused of being an optimist, and it's true I had to hunt pretty hard to find any good news in the board's report. As you know, it's well stocked with criticisms, which I'll discuss in a moment. But I was very relieved to read this sentence. The board is convinced that the president does indeed want the full story to be told. And that will continue to be my pledge to you as the other investigations go forward. I want to thank the members of the panel, former John, Senator John Tower, former Secretary of State Edmund Muskie, and former National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft. They have done the nation, as well as me personally, a great service by submitting a report of such integrity and depth. They have my genuine and enduring gratitude. I've studied the board's report, 
Its findings are honest, convincing, and highly critical, and I accept them. And tonight, I want to share with you my thoughts on these findings and report to you on the actions I'm taking to implement the Board's recommendations. First, let me say I take full responsibility for my own actions and for those of my administration. As angry as I may be about activities undertaken without my knowledge, I am still accountable for those activities. As disappointed as I may be in some who serve me, I am still the one who must answer to the American people for this behavior. And as personally distasteful as I find secret bank accounts and diverted funds, well, as the Navy would say, this happened on my watch. Let's start with the part that is the most controversial. A few months ago, I told the American people I did not trade arms for hostages. My heart and my best intentions still tell me that's true, but the facts and the evidence tell me it is not. As the Tower Board reported, what began as a strategic opening to Iran deteriorated in its implementation into trading arms for hostages. This runs counter to my own beliefs, to administration policy, and to the original strategy we had in mind. There are reasons why it happened, but no excuses. It was a mistake. I undertook the original Iran initiative in order to develop relations with those who might assume leadership in a post-Khomeini government. It's clear from the board's report, however, that I let my personal concern for the hostages spill over into the geopolitical strategy of reaching out to Iran. I asked so many questions about the hostages' welfare that I didn't ask enough about the specifics of the total Iran plan. Let me say to the hostage families, we have not given up. We never will. And I promise you we'll use every legitimate means to free your loved ones from captivity. Sir, uh, the Republicans are trying to blame you for the existence of a small air base at Mena, Arkansas. This base was set up by George Bush and Oliver North and uh, the CIA to help the Iran Contras, and they brought in plane load after plane load of cocaine there for sale in the United States, and then they took the money and bought weapons and took them back to the Contras, all of which was illegal, as you know, under the Bolin Act. But tell me, did they tell you that this had to be in existence because of national security? Well, let me answer the question. No, they didn't tell me anything about it. They didn't say anything to me about it. The airport in question and all the events in question were the subject of state and federal inquiries. It was primarily a matter for federal jurisdiction. The state really had next to nothing to do with it. The local prosecutor did conduct an investigation based on what was within the jurisdiction of state law. The rest of it was under jurisdiction of the United States attorneys who were appointed successively by previous administrations. We had nothing, zero, to do with it, and everybody who's ever looked into it knows that. Polk County Prosecutor Charles Blight, the man who initially attempted to investigate the MENA Arkansas criminal activities, would surely take exception to Mr. Clinton's assertion that, quote, the local prosecutor did conduct an investigation based on what was within the jurisdiction of the state law, end quote. In fact, it was Blyke who went directly to then-Governor Clinton to seek funding for his investigation, seeing as how rural Polk County lacked the financial resources to deal with the CIA. When it became apparent that uh, nothing was going to be done on the federal level, that's when I began more actively pursuing it. Prosecutor Black, a Clinton supporter, met with the governor and handed him a letter requesting money for a state grand jury on MENA. His response to me was that he would uh, uh, get a man, something to the effect that he would get a man on it and would get word back to me. And uh, I never heard back. Years later, Clinton said he offered $25,000 to Prosecutor Black's boss to fund a grand jury. But Charles Black and his boss claim they never heard about any offer of money from Governor Clinton. I believe Bill Clinton's an honest, respectable man, and I have to believe that he did that. But the fact is, I never got that word myself. Black State and local cops in the South often appear to know the score. When we told one Louisiana law enforcement source what we had learned from Miami attorney Richard Sharpstein about how the hit team had been getting orders from Oliver North, he said simply, that doesn't surprise me at all, unquote. 
Then we discovered while see why Seal had been so unconcerned about being killed by the Medellin cartel. I asked Barry why he wasn't worried about the Colombians killing him, stated close associate mob pilot Rene Martin. He said he told the Colombians he was going to pull a fast one and testify for Ochoa against the U.S. government. Unquote. Uh, Ochoa was a member of the Medellin cartel. Continuing. Two weeks before he died, Barry Seal had hired a private investigator in Miami, Steve Dinnerstein, to run FAA title searches on 15 different airplanes he had used in his smuggling enterprise. Seal was getting ready to talk about who owned his smuggling fleet 15 years ago. Barry Seal was assassinated because he was getting ready to talk. He had even contacted a Paramount Studios production vice president about making a movie. While the killers approached Barry Seal's Cadillac in the Baton Rouge twilight, Seal had been on his car phone with a CIA aircraft procurement executive in Arizona, Bill Lambeth, who will himself be murdered in Phoenix seven years later. Suddenly cut off, and fearing the worst, Lambeth frantically dialed Barry's home, no home number where his wife Debbie answered. I think something's wrong with Barry, Lambeth said ominously. Debbie, unable to reach her husband, bundled her three small children into the car and frantically headed for the Salvation Army halfway house where he'd been sentenced to sleep for six months. On the way, she stopped at a payphone to make another attempt to reach her husband and learned he was now unreachable, unquote. He's not going to the hospital, she remembers being told. He's dead. Don't come here, Debbie. Don't. As she returned to her car, she could see through her tears her three small children's heads barely peeking over the car seats. And though Barry Seal is anything but blameless, his three small children were. They symbolize the millions of lives ruined by a phony drug war whose only purpose is to line still more the pockets of a crew of elite deviants who took over our country. All I could think of was my poor little babies, my poor babies, Debbie Seal told us, choking back tears. I didn't know how I was, go how I was going to tell them that their daddy was dead. Unquote. On the night of August 23rd, 1987, just outside the little town of Alexander, Arkansas, Kevin Ives, 17, and Don Henry, 16, witnessed a cocaine drop, which was part of the drug smuggling operation in Mena, Arkansas. The boys were captured and their hands were tied behind their backs. They were kicked and beaten and finally executed. One of the boys was stabbed to death. The bodies were wrapped in a tarpaulin and placed across the railway tracks to be mangled by the next train. The Arkansas medical examiner, Fami Malik, ruled the deaths an accident. He said the boys had smoked marijuana joints and had fallen into a trance on the railway tracks side by side. As the facts would later show, the crime lab never tested the concentration of marijuana in their blood. They were told to back Malik's ruling. Bill Clinton was the only person to whom the crime lab answered. Kevin Ives' mother, Linda, created such a stir that a grand jury was called to investigate the case. The bodies were exhumed, and a second autopsy was conducted by the Atlanta medical examiner, Dr. Joseph Burton. He showed an enhanced photograph of the wound to six other forensic investigators. They all concurred that it was a stab wound. He also found that Kevin Ives had been smashed in the head with a rifle butt. The report of the grand jury concluded that the deaths of Don Henry and Kevin Ives were definitely the result of foul play. It urged that law enforcement agencies, the prosecuting attorney's office, to continue the investigation into the deaths of Don Henry and Kevin Ives and into the drug problem in Saline County. Because of Linda Ives' investigation into the death of her son, she was placed on Bill Clinton's enemy list by White House counsel Mark Fabian. Already, people associated with the case were beginning to die in what amounted to a reign of terror among young people in Alexander, Arkansas. April 1988, Keith Coney told his mother he knew too much about the Ives Henry murders and feared for his life. After being slashed in the neck, he was fleeing for his life on his motorcycle when he slammed into the back of a truck and was killed. Booney Bearden, a friend of the boys, disappeared. His body was never found. November 1988, Keith McCaskill claimed to have knowledge of the Ives-Henry murders, but was killed before he could testify. 
McCaskill, knowing that his life was in danger, had said goodbye to his friends and family. He died from 113 stab wounds. January 1989, Gregory Collins claimed to have knowledge of the Ives Henry murders, but was killed before he could testify. Collins was found dead from a shotgun blast to the face. April 1989, Jeff Rhodes claimed to have knowledge of the Ives Henry murders, but was killed before he could testify. His body was found in the city dump, dead of a gunshot wound to the head. July 1989, Richard Winters claimed to have knowledge of the Ives Henry murders, but was killed before he could testify. Winters was silenced by a blast from a sawed off shotgun. June 1990, Jordan Kettleson claimed to have information on the Ives Henry murders, but was killed before he could testify. He died from a shotgun blast to the head. To date, no arrests have been made in regard to these murders. Arkansas's medical examiner ruled the death of two teenage boys an accident, while several forensic investigators and a grand jury concluded they were murdered. But this was not the first nor the last time that Fami Malik's rulings would cause controversy. In 1985, a North Arkansas man was fatally shot, and Fami Malik ruled it a suicide. There were four gunshot wounds to the chest. In a 1986 case, Malik's ruling was accidental drowning. It was later discovered that the victim had been shot in the head. In 1992, a man's body was found with five bullet wounds, but Malik nevertheless ruled it a suicide. In his most incredible ruling, Malik concluded that a James Milam had died of an ulcer. However, the man's skull was later recovered. He had been decapitated with a sharp knife. That Malik survived in Arkansas is a testament to Clinton's power. Just before Clinton announced his intentions to run for president, Malik was moved to another state job. At the height of, of you selling cocaine with the Nicaraguans, um, were you actually going to Nicaragua and everything else? No, like I've never been to Nicaragua. Never. You, you never wanted to go and meet with I the. I didn't need to. They asked me. Oh, the, the, they invited you? Yeah, to Mexico too. Okay. Now, when you hear of cocaine, you always, you always hear of Pablo Escobar, you hear of Colombia and so forth. Were you dealing with the, with the Colombians at all? They were. Oh, the Nicaraguans were. Oh, so yeah, that I was think, being done. I think they were dealing with the Choas. Uh, the Escobar and uh, and the Medellin at that time. I think Medellin was 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 another one of the top families. The Pablo Escobar never tried to reach out to you directly, and no, nah. it was he was too big. I mean, I guess like he was moving too much. I don't know. I probably wouldn't have talked to him anyway. Okay, I picked who I wanted to talk to. You had, you, you know, not to interrupt this. Uh, this is an interview with uh, Rick Ross who he was totally unaware, but his connection was working for the CIA. And he's one of the main people who he didn't invent crack. And he says that, but as far as in the, you know, LA Southern California area was probably the guy who spread I'm trying to think of a way to explain it um made it popular I guess and spread the use of it now this uh interview it's it's on um I I don't want to say what it's on cuz I don't want to badmouth the guy he he gets the a lot of really good guests but he's a fucking terrible interviewer this guy um, I don't know how, um, his name in his name is DJ. I'll just say that. So I don't know if he's an actual DJ, so he's able to get these guests and, you know, he, he gets a lot of views on YouTube, but he's terrible at fucking interviewing people, but there's still some good information on this. And, um, Rick Ross, of course, I'm not talking about the rapper, the rapper took his name from uh, Freeway Rick Ross, this guy who was a real drug dealer who, unbeknownst to him, 
was actually selling drugs for the CIA. And we'll, we'll get into him later a little. He's not a major part of this in the sense that, you know, the CIA was bringing drugs in as far as who they were distributing them to to sell is kind of irrelevant, to be honest. I mean, they were bringing it into the U.S. and then it was getting from these people to these people or whatever. Um, in his case, he dealt with uh, this guy, Blandone, and he's mentioned in the movie Kill the Messenger is um, Gary Webb's story. It it bothered me because I had watched a video about this guy who wrote a book about Iran-Contra, and he mentioned Gary Webb, and he mentioned that he committed suicide. The guy was shot twice in the fucking head. To just say he committed suicide as like it's a fact just because the coroner says so um, when he was shot twice in the head, it just doesn't make sense. Obviously, with what was going on, just like the clip I just played about those two kids that were killed, the coroner was on Bill Clinton's payroll or um, only had a job because of Bill Clinton because from what I understand and other stuff I listened to, he fucked up a bunch of stuff. So, of course, he's going to come back and say, oh, yeah, these guys were... And I'll get into that story because that's a really fucked up story. Um, But later, I'm trying to kind of go through uh, chronologically, not with the clips, but at least with when I'm going through... uh, bringing up what happened in the, in this whole thing, um, you know, starting with 79, 80, talking about the, the election and all the stuff I was talking about earlier. But Rick Ross was just a distributor who was getting cocaine from uh, a CIA operative. So he was working with, the Medellin cartel, which I do know a lot about um, from watching documentaries, and the show Narcos is based on them. Some of it is true. Some of it, again, dramatic effect. You got to remember when you watch anything that's uh, not an actual documentary, um, even in documentaries, they don't lie, but I mean, they're going to show what's entertaining. But most documentaries are relatively true. But I wouldn't just go by one documentary and just take that as a gospel. I mean, that's why, you know, I'll watch multiple and stuff like that, multiple documentaries and try to read articles. And I need to get back into reading more books because I really think that's the best source when it comes to any historical stuff. And even historical could be, you know, a couple years ago, anything that's just not right now. Um, because obviously it takes time to write a book. But um, Rick Ross didn't know that Blandone was a CIA operative, and he ended up uh, testifying against him. And in the, if you haven't seen Kill the Messenger, you should watch it. It's another uh, movie based on the life of Gary Webb. It's relatively uh, accurate from what I understand. And um, sorry, going back to the Medellin cartel, the Medellin cartel was uh, Pablo Escobar, Carlos Later, which was uh, the movie Blow, the Johnny Depp's partner, uh, I forget his name in the movie, was loosely based on Carlos Later. That's who he was supposed to be. And he ended up going to jail in the U.S., and the Ocho Ocho brothers, who were the smart ones who tried to lay low, were the main uh, Midian cartel uh, people. I think there was uh, a couple other. There might be somebody I'm missing there, but those were the main guys. And then after that, after Pablo Escobar was killed, the Midian cartels went on, but the Cali cartel kind of became the main cartel. And now, from what I understand, it's all Mexico. But uh, the cartels that are running um, things and, and how it moved, I, you know, I I don't know a lot about that. But anyway, uh, 
Rick Ross does have some stuff to say in this interview uh, on the Iran uh, Contra uh, scandal and how he was actually making money for the CIA because he would buy drugs from them. And then, of course, he made money for himself as well. But at the same time, you know, he's buying the drugs from the CIA and he doesn't even know it. And then, you know, making money for himself. So I I don't know what would have happened if he didn't end up getting busted. He he talks about he got busted by local police that the CIA at some point would have, you know, had the DEA come in or something like that. But um, that's kind of the story, I guess, of uh, in short, you know, I'm sure there's a lot more to it. But he was known as like the crack king of uh, L.A. in Southern California. I don't know that he really went beyond that and that he really needed to. Um, he said he was making like $200,000 a day minimum. At the height of, of you selling cocaine with the Nicaraguans, um, were you actually going to Nicaragua and everything else? No, nah, like I've never been to Nicaragua. Never? You, you never wanted to go and meet with I the... I didn't to. They asked me. Oh, the, the, they invited you? Yeah, to Mexico too. Okay. Now, when you hear of cocaine, you always, you always hear of Pablo Escobar, you hear of Colombia and so forth. Were you dealing with the, with the Colombians at all? They were. Oh, the Nicaraguans were. Oh, so yeah, that I was think, being done. I think they were dealing with the Choas, uh, the Escobar, and... Uh, and let me just say, and, and sorry, I started from the beginning. Uh, I won't restart it from the beginning again. Um, that Rick Ross, I, I have no problem with assuming he didn't kill anybody, which I don't think he did. He tried to lay low. He was smart uh, when it came to that. And most drug dealers, people, they want you to believe that uh, the majority of drug dealers are violent, and that is not the case. You know, when you're talking about these cartels and stuff like that, that's a different story. But the majority of drug dealers are not violent. But if people actually knew that, it would fuck up the police and their uh, approach to drug dealers where they're, you know, raiding them with a SWAT team and all of that shit. And if you think about it, if they really cared about getting drugs off the street and that was their goal... They wouldn't need a no-knock warrant because if they flushed it down the toilet, who gives a fuck? They get rid of it that way. Um, and I had always said that. it was It's just ridiculous the way they uh, approached that. But I, I don't think Rick Ross did anything wrong assuming that he didn't kill anybody. Um, and uh, maybe people in his crew did uh, or people that he sold drugs to as a uh because obviously he was on the level of a distributor to people that were selling drugs directly to people like he wasn't on the corner selling you know uh grams of crack or something or or crack rocks uh so as someone who believes that drugs should be legal and that a lot of the drugs from pharmaceutical companies, like I keep talking about SSRIs, are worse for you. And they don't even know, you know, the long term effects of them than some of the drugs on the street. Now, I, I'm not saying you should go do crack. Um, it's not, <laughs> especially, I did a report on crack. I've never done uh, crack or cocaine or really any drugs for that matter. Uh, I've talked about this, um, except uh, prescription drugs, and I tried uh, marijuana. The last time I did it was uh, 20 years ago. So, um, But Rick Ross, um, in, in the crack business, from, from what I understand, um, it gets you high for like five minutes. At least that's what my research and when did I do that paper? Like, geez, a long time ago. But Coke got you high, something like 15 minutes, crack for like five. And, and 
I bet it would depend on the cut, like how much they're cutting it. And if you're buying just like a gram, they're probably cutting it a lot. And, and that's the whole thing, too. You know, drugs being illegal, it really makes them totally unsafe. Not to say that they'd be safe just because they were made uh, properly by a chemist that knew that they were do what they were doing and by a company that you could trust. But remember that cocaine is also a plant. Now they put chemicals into uh, to extract certain chemicals out of the leaf. So there's certain chemicals out of the coca uh, plant that they need to extract. And they go through this process. I've been watching a lot of documentaries. <laughs> and they use some chemicals to do that. You know, there might be a better way to do it that is better for you. And, of course, putting something up your nose is not healthy for you neither. But, you know, if they, if cocaine was legal, which it used to be, um, and you could buy it, you know, right off the shelves. And they developed it into something like a pill or something like that, that made it safer, not to mention the fact that, you know, you're buying drugs from people that are not the most reliable people. A lot of them are shady. You don't know what you're getting, all of these things contribute to, and it's never brought up, you know, all these documentaries I watch, it's never brought up the legal uh, legalization of drugs might eliminate a lot of uh, overdoses or might eliminate uh, a lot of health problems or things like that. So, not to mention, you know, you own your body and if you want to destroy it, that's fine. But if you could get a healthier form of something and you wouldn't have to worry and you wouldn't have to pay all this money for it. Um, I was going to sell cocaine at some at some point a long time ago when I was in my early 20s and the last time I remember was like $50 a gram and you think about that I don't know how long it takes somebody to go through a gram but that's a lot of money I guess if you're buying it you know in bulk the more you buy the cheaper it is but it's not a cheap drug neither so the two biggest things that I, I always mention when it comes to drugs is that are the biggest causes of problems because I think the majority of people that do drugs, to be honest with you, are functional drug users that don't have problems with their lives or anything like that. The reason they have problems is there's actually three things. It's illegal. So people that get arrested, it costs too much money and you don't know what you're getting or it's hard to get. So if you take those three things out of it, if it's legal, if it's affordable and you can go buy it at the store and it's made by a company where you can trust what you're getting. And if they did uh, do something where, you know, it was poisoned or something like that, then the company would be responsible. And obviously they don't want to kill their customers neither. Um, drug dealers on the street, I don't think they want to kill their customers, but it's not hard to to find them, um, you know, corporations or it doesn't have to necessarily be corporations, but companies that are trying to sell products don't want to kill their customers, nor do they want to be known and have that reputation. That's the other thing. Everybody would know um, that that company, you know, they'd be done. So all of those things would help people because the bottom line is if you want to do coke you're gonna do it i never uh, understood the attraction to drugs that speed you up um i drank a lot at certain periods in my life 
way too much at certain times. But I haven't drank in a couple of years and not because of any particular reason other than I just don't want to. I, I just lost the the want for alcohol, to be honest. And I got sick of the hangovers and all of that stuff. But I think alcohol is the worst drug that exists or at least will tie other drugs. You know, crystal meth may be pretty bad. It It, it It sounds like, you know, anything that has that many chemicals in it, you know, health wise, even if it's doesn't fuck you up that bad, it's going to do some serious damage to you in the long term. Something like opium, and I've talked about this before, what's worse for you is the fact that they put acetaminophen in painkillers, you know, and in heroin, who knows what else you're getting, but something like opium As far as I know, long term, it's not going to do any damage to you. I mean, no more than, you know, any over the counter drug would. You know, something like cocaine, snorting it up your nose, it's going to fuck up your, your nasal passage and all that stuff. Or, um, I guess maybe smoking it, it wouldn't be as bad, but, you know, crack, you don't know what the fuck it's mixed with. Uh, I know they mix it with baking soda, but then people have their special recipes. Um, again, I've been watching a lot of uh, Drugs, Inc. It, it's interesting to watch, but it's a lot of propaganda, too, because they're showing one side of it. They're they're making They're making it out to be they want people to believe that things are one way that things are so dangerous and just like they do with you know guns and school shootings and terrorism and because then you need government you know the need for government to be involved in all of these things or the want for government to be like a parent has greatly increased and that I think has been their plan since the beginning but how people uh, actually support that shit is just unbelievable to me and I don't want to get into a whole thing on this but you know we need there's a lot we need to do and it's not through the system through the system that window has closed a long long time ago and that's why yesterday when i mentioned somebody saying that the people are the government but then that same person said today that the government's an oligarchy which is a contradiction you can't say the government's an oligarchy but (laughs) the people are the government it it's it's a total contradiction but anyway um i don't want to waste any more time on this i, I think we'll probably go to at least nine thirty tonight because there's just so much to cover and then if anybody i know more of the listens unfortunately are to the archives which is fine i mean a listen is a listen if you're listening to me that's great i really appreciate anybody who would take the time to listen to me um I try to listen to me just to find ways to improve. And sometimes I got to turn it the fuck off. So anybody that can listen, especially when I was doing three hours, you know, I I really appreciate that, that somebody would actually want to listen to me. But, um, yeah, we'll, um, probably go to, to nine 30 just because there's so much to talk about on this topic. But again, if there's anybody listening uh, live that has any comments or anything, Skype's the best way, especially if you have a good microphone. So you can always Skype in or call. I don't remember the last time I got a call. But again, that's because most people listen um, to the archives, you know, which is fine. I mean, it's great that we have them, you know, and people can just listen when they have the time or they can listen to part of the show. They don't have to listen to the whole thing in one sitting or whatnot. 
you know, they can pick up where they left off. And the, the technology that we have today is great. Uh, although you have the government using it for things that it shouldn't be used for. And I, I just want to mention this, and I'm sorry, I know I've kind of gone on a, a while here, but uh, so I don't forget, Snowden is opening on Friday. So I would recommend you go see that. The only issue I have with Snowden, I consider him a hero and and I mean the risk he took and everything he did, and I have a lot of respect for him. But he still thinks the NSA should exist. And it bothers me when you have people that have seen and have witnessed the things that the government are doing. It's bad enough when you know all this shit, like to the extent that I do. And it's not that because I'm, you know, I have secret information that other people don't. I mean, anybody can get the information that I have. I just took the time to go out and read and and before I started the show I was reading a lot and then of course you know read articles and now I'm uh being that I don't have as much time I constantly watch documentaries or listen to documentaries um and try to get at least two or three minimum on the subject so I can get different perspectives um and as well as you know read articles as on on whatever topic I'm talking about and then of course I you know have just knowledge from education and growing up and and uh, being opinionated and and kind of having similar views uh my whole life as I was talking about I think yesterday I've always been a rebel and somebody who stood up and and never I've always had a I guess, distaste for the government. I was never, never supported the government. I was never a member of a political party. I always thought drugs should be legal since I can remember as well as guns. Now, I wasn't to the point I am now where I don't think the government should exist. I, I, I believe in an organized society, but not with government. Now, how we accomplish that, that's a whole nother issue. But, um, I believe that government, and this is something I've never heard anybody say, but that the purpose of government is to totally take over. And all governments are established for that purpose. And I, I'm not against the U.S. government as much as I'm just against government. And I've mentioned this before, but just to clarify, you have those people that, yeah, the U.S. is oppressive and all this and that, but then they support some other government. And it's like, those are the people that are kind of, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, I can understand people that get frustrated with that kind of thinking, I guess, like you know, people that insult the U.S. government but then praise Cuba or something. You know, you won't hear me praising any communist government or any government for that matter. Although some are better than others, of course. You know, I'd rather be here than the majority of countries. I'm sure there's a couple countries out there that I'd be freer in whether it's because I could pay the police off or they're just not, uh, they don't enforce their laws the same way where it's not as big of a deal. So I'm going to shut up now, play the rest of this clip. And when we come back, we'll uh, get back to where we left off and I'll try to stay on till at least nine 30. And then of course, when we come back tomorrow, we will continue with this because this is a this is an important issue and this is something that is all out there. The information, what happened with the government, how the government was involved. I think what happens is people get too involved with the names and the faces and the individuals instead of the institution. 
So they look at it as, oh, those were just the bad, like the bad apple mentality. That it's not the institution. It's, well, when, when we get better people in, it will be okay. And people have been saying that over and over and over again. So we'll get back to this uh, clip. Thanks for listening to my long uh, <laughs> kind of uh, whatever you want to call that rant there. So we'll get we'll get back to this clip and uh, be right back. And Medellin at that time, I think Medellin was 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 another one of the top families. The Pablo Escobar never tried to reach out to you directly, and no, nah. it was he was too big. I mean, I guess like he was moving too much. I don't know. I probably wouldn't have talked to him anyway. Okay. I picked who I wanted to talk to. You had your connect. It, wor- it worked for you, and you stuck good. with your connect all the way. Through. I wasn't. I wasn't looking for customers, and I wasn't looking for connects. Okay. So, you get a, go to jail. You come out. You're not dealing cocaine anymore. Right. But then Blandone reaches out to you, mm-hmm. and wants you to do one more deal. Well, he didn't really want me to do the deal. He wanted me to introduce him to somebody. Okay. That would do a deal with him. I mean, it kind of sounds like the movie Blow a little bit. I mean, well, you know, all drug deals are almost the same. You know, um, when somebody's working with DEA, they, they use the same tactic. Okay. It's just I never saw the movie Blow. <laughs> oh, you, you never saw it? I saw it now, you know. Me and right. Nick Cassavetti wrote a script together, the guy who wrote Blow. And, and I also had the uh, opportunity to meet uh, uh, George as well. Boston George. <laughs> Boston, George. Okay, was that before or after? When he got out. Oh, when he, oh, he's out. Yeah, he's out. Oh, okay. So, if you look at, for example, a Boston, George, and a, and a Freeway Rick, who who was the bigger entity? You know, just so people can kind of get it in perspective. I don't know. You know, because I don't really know what Boston George was doing. Okay, fair you know, enough. I don't know his. So, but you never had to interact with him. Or no, anything. I didn't, and I didn't care. Yeah. See, I was gonna make my two hundred thousand every day. Right. That's all I cared about. Okay. What this guy is doing, none of my business. Why do I need to know his business? Fair enough. I want to keep him out of mind. Okay. So you hook up with Blandone again, and he wanted you to introduce you to, to someone and so right. forth, and you eventually do it. And what happens next? Police, helicopters. It's like a party. Boom. Oh. Cars are pop. People heads are popping up out of cars, and I mean it was a setup. So, explain the whole Iran Contra thing, and what your role in it, and what Blandon's role was in it. Well, my role was that Blandon would bring me drugs to sell to raise money for the Contras. Uh, the Contras was backed by the CIA, which was Ronald Reagan and George Bush, and George Bush's pet peeve, George Bush Senior's pet peeve. Uh, they felt that if they lost Nicaragua, that um, Russia would be marching down the streets of the United States. Okay, but where's the Iran part? Well, they sold guns to Iran and took the money and gave it to the Contras. But then they were also selling drugs, well, they were allowing drugs to pass through <clears throat> into America and using that money and putting it to the Contras as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But the initial money come from Iran because the uh, Congress had said that they couldn't give the Contras any money. So they had to get it from a source that nobody would know about. It, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's so much there. You know, it, you, get, you really got to do your homework. And then, you know, they also had the hostages in Iran that Ronald Reagan was able to get them loose because he was going to give them weapons for the hostages along with getting some money. How much of this did you actually know about? None. So, I learned so, all this while I was in jail. Okay, so when you were actually selling drugs and so forth, did, did it seem... I didn't care about Iran. <laughs> yeah. You didn't care about... None of that stuff. The man. Contras in Nicaragua, nothing. You were just, you were just selling drugs. And man, let's make some money. All this is happening, and the CIA is actually overlooking this whole process. Right? From what I understand. From what you understand. Yeah. I didn't see the CIA doing it, but, you know, they came back and said, yeah, we were, we were watching them. We okay. were helping them. 
At, at a certain point, did you ever think, you know, I'm getting all this, all this cocaine. No. And no one's getting busted. And I mean, we're we're. Well, people were getting busted. Okay, I mean, my were, guys, were, my were, guys there, were getting busted. Were, were there uh, huge seizures and everything else like that? Like, were you expecting a big, a big package one day and it just never came, and there was a drought until the no. next? No. No, we didn't have those issues. And do you think it was because the CIA was involved? No, I don't know. That wasn't my wasn't my lane. Okay. You know, I I don't know what Danilo and them had going on. So so you weren't actually involved in the smuggling of it all. No, you, not at so, all. So so when I got of, it, it was already here. Okay, you didn't care how it got over there. No, I didn't, not at all. And you weren't. It's not like you you would pick up some huge. Uh, you know, some huge storage canister with like a billion dollars worth. You, you you were getting. I got mine issued daily. Daily. Yeah. You, you were never getting a huge, massive no. amount. No. Okay. Is there a reason why you, you you they dealt with the risk of daily as opposed to one big monthly haul? Well, that's what I could pay for. I usually took what I could pay for. Okay. I didn't really like credit either. Okay, so you never actually had credit with these guys. No, nah, because then you know, if you take credit from people, then you kind of like work for them. Right. Then they could start telling you what to do. And nobody was able to tell me what to do. Okay. I did what I wanted to do. When when you hear the horror stories of dealing with these overseas drug, you know, operations where people's entire families would end up dead and, you know, like people would fuck off some money and, and so forth like that. Did you ever deal with any of that around you? Like, did you ever see that type of stuff happening? Well, I know, I, I've known of people getting killed. You know, somebody come in to rob the place and, and kill everybody in the house. I've heard of that. And, yeah. You know, no streets that it happened on, you know, in L.A. Uh, but it's, you know, kidnapping. I mean, a lot of, that, you know, a lot of that's part, you know, you run around this the street with two, three hundred thousand, a million dollars, you know, and everybody else is making you know, you figure at that time, a good job in L.A. was like five hundred dollars. You know, yeah. so it's tempting. You know. So that deal with Blandone puts you right back in prison again. Yeah. And at that point, they gave you life. Life without the possibility of parole. How did you feel when when you okay you you went to trial with it? I went to trial. I guess you don't plea bargain for life. <laughs> <laughs> they asked me to. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh, with like a with a possibility of parole kind of thing. Yeah, they they uh, I wanted a twenty year deal, and they offered me a plea where I pled guilty. Um, and if the judge wanted to give me twenty, she could. But if she wanted to give me life, she could. You didn't want to risk that. No, nah, I said no. Nah, I'll take my chance on appeal. So you went to trial. How much, did you, how much did you spend? I mean, did you I have helped money? the jury out, though. The jury stayed out for a day and a half. Okay. They thought about letting me go. Did you have money at this point or no? A little. A little bit, but not like before? No. Okay. Money was gone. The money was gone. Where did the money go? All kind of places, you know, people. People grab you in prison, you know. When, when I got arrested on the first case, they put in there I was going to get life. So everyone's grabbing everything they can grab. He don't need it anymore. So you go to trial again, yep, and you lose lose life without the possibility of parole. How, how did you feel when they read that to you? Mad, uh, sad because my mom was there. She broke down in court. A uh, bunch of different feelings, you know. You end up going to prison, and how did you manage to actually get out of that life? That life sentence. Well, I taught myself to read or write. Okay, you were illiterate up to this point. Yeah, pretty much. I could read a little. You know, I started learning how to read. Okay. Uh, but I was still, you know, pretty a little bit. But uh, uh, I just started practicing reading every day. Started reading law books. And then one day, you know, I'm sitting there reading. And the words that I needed, continuous criminal spree, popped out. And I was like, oh, wow, that's what I've been needing. On that case, I did 14 in about an eight or nine months. I understand that mindset because I like have that like because you don't believe in somebody so much you just joke on them like I'm going to joke on you. I don't believe you. You are listening to Nonpartisan Liberty for All Radio with your host, Dave Bourne. Call in at 
470-7664 or Skype in. Username, Nonpartisan Booty for All. Nonpartisan Liberty for All, and we are back after my long uh, rant there during the <laughs> Rick Ross video. So um, I apologize for that. Uh, well, sort of, I guess. It depends. If you didn't like it, I apologize for it. If you did, then I, I don't. Um, anyway, when it comes to drugs, that, that's just something that is it really is starting to just bother the fuck out of me. And it's not for any personal reason. It's just the fact that, you know, especially in reading the that book, uh, Rise of the Warrior Cop by Radley Balco, and how the drug war affects everybody. And... It started to militarize the police. They did more of the no-knock warrants, all of that. They went to the wrong houses and killed people. It, there were stories about little girls being killed. There, all this shit. I mean, it, even recently, there was the the baby that they threw a fucking flashbang grenade in there because the guy sold like $50 worth of crystal meth. I mean, it is the most ridiculous thing. You have asset forfeiture where basically... uh and this this doesn't even have to do with drugs always. I mean, the fact that they can take um, everything because they can claim you got it from drugs just because of one drug charge is ridiculous. But now they have the structuring laws where they don't even have to charge you with a fucking crime and they can just say, well, we're going to take your money because we think that you possibly... Um, or doing something illegal. And then you have to hire a lawyer to get it back. And a lot of times, if it's if it's like 10 grand, you're going to pay more in fucking lawyer's fees. So you just got robbed by the government. And and, 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 and they're not criminals? I, I, I don't get how people don't see this for what it is. I mean, they are a mafia. They extort people. That's what they do. And they keep moving closer and closer to controlling every aspect of your life. So, um, it's just, it's, it's crazy. But when it comes to drugs, if they were, first of all, the, the amount of people actually dying from drugs and all of that shit, it, it's it's very minimal and it's not the issues they want to make it out to be. And again, half of them or probably more than half of drug uh, problems, it's the problem that people go to jail, can't afford it or can't get it or are getting shit. Um, you know, because it's, it's from street chemists that are cutting it with who knows what, uh, especially with heroin where they're, uh, they want people to OD because it's better for business. It's, it's insane. Um, but it it's frustrating to me that before 1914, you could walk into a store, and now they're doing this with Kratom, where now you can walk into a store and buy it. It's a fucking plant that is just crushed up into powder, and you can order it online or you can buy it in smoke shops, and now they're going to schedule one it as of September 30th. And it's just frustrating that they want to control all of this shit, and you can't really do much about it because depending on the drug, it's not like you can make it yourself and say, fuck you to the government. It's an area where it's hard to get around it. I mean, yeah, you can buy it on the street, but you got to buy it for more money. So you have that issue and, you know, availability and finding somebody and all that shit. And it's just it. It, it, it's fucked up and it's fucking up people's lives who shouldn't be. I mean, people are going to jail for 10, 20 years 
in some cases because of drugs. It's just, it is one of the most fucked up things that the government claims the right to your own fucking body. And people don't get that. I don't give a fuck if a million people a year died from drugs. I mean, I would care, but I mean, that's not going to change my opinion. Because if you look at certain foods and how many people have heart attacks, heart attacks and cancer are the two leading killers. And and speaking of cancer, there was just an article uh, recently based on a study that half the people are, are dying from fucking chemotherapy. But, you know, they're making a lot of money off it. So um, I don't want to go off on another whole tangent. So we'll get uh, back to this, especially since we have a lot of information to cover. And it is very interesting information. So where I left off was really the start of the war. So Reagan had, you know, that same mentality where he wanted to do all the covert ops He wanted to bring back in the CIA. I guess Carter cut a certain amount, not enough, because the CIA should never existed in the first place. And it was it was never supposed to be a permanent agency. But as we all know, there's no such thing as a temporary agency. Government loves to add agencies. You can look them up. I had this document that I got from a government website That listed every agency. I mean, it's fucking ridiculous. The amount of agencies. And because of this rulemaking law, most of these agencies can make laws uh, when it comes to their specific uh, realm, like the DEA. And supposedly the DEA needs the approval of the attorney general, but... Um, I would assume that, you know, in most cases, the attorney general just signs off and you have the DEA law enforcement who it's in their benefit. It benefits them to ban more drugs, as does it the attorney general deciding what the fuck do these people know about health? Again, it it doesn't matter. The health part shouldn't matter if I want to put fucking gasoline in my body. You know, that's my business. Although I I wouldn't do that and I don't advise anybody else to do it. But um, and and that's why you have things like crystal meth or people inhaling glue and shit like that. You know, half of drugs exist because they ban the other half. Anyway, um, and then the whole hypocritical thing is. And this has to do with all their laws that they don't apply to them. That you'll go to jail for 20 years, but the CIA will bring in, you know, fucking 500 kilos of cocaine. And that's okay because, you know, they're the government. But according to some people, the government is the people, uh, which is one of the fucking most ignorant fucking things. And I've heard that more than once, but it's one of the most ignorant fucking things you could say when it comes to government, that the government are the people. No, the government is an independent fucking corporation. Anyway, every state, it they, literally they are like incorporated. So you had fucking Reagan and his, uh, you know, the anti-communists. And again, I I had mentioned before the break that Reagan snitched out all his friends. And these are people that, you know, in Hollywood in the 30s, they joined the Communist Party. I don't know if it was like the in thing to do or plus the depression and stuff like that. I don't know how serious they were with it, but it was this big, it's kind of like, you know, terrorism now, how they inflate the threat of terrorism. It was this huge fear of communism. So that's what got them in Vietnam. That's what got them in Korea and the Korean War. And that's what got them into this. 
in the in Nicaragua because instead of staying out of shit, especially civil wars, and this wasn't even really a civil war, it was a bunch of rebels, but shit that happens in their own country, think about if another country, you know, the United States is a very hypocritical country, and I think it's because the amount of power they have, you know, any other country, if they became the a world power, they'd be the same way. So that's why I say that I don't necessarily, it's not the U S it's government. Um, because if any other country became a world power, they'd pretty much be the same way. I believe, although in the case of the U S, like I said, they've done everything so calculated and so smart And, you know, I'm not trying to, it sounds like I'm, I'm complimenting them. I'm not complimenting them, but they've done it in a way where, and I think the Nazis that they brought in in Operation Paperclip uh, helped a lot as well. But I mean, even before that, and everything that they do is so calculated in the propaganda and all this shit. And if you don't think they have all of these offices of propaganda and all of this shit, even in this, they created a, a office of propaganda specifically for what was going on in Iran Contra. And we'll get to that. But so you have the Sandinistas um, that are communist. Then you have a bunch of kind of just fringe rebels that are unorganized and all kind of doing their own thing. And some of them left the the country. Um, Some of them, I guess, kind of isolated themselves. But supposedly the CIA was the one really running this thing. They organized everybody together they, I mean, you had people, I think, that were against the government, but if it wasn't for the CIA, I don't know that any of this would have happened. And they shouldn't have got involved in the first place. You know, if people want to go over and help them and fund them, I think that's fine. But the government should have stayed out of it. But Reagan had his anti-communist, you know, Oliver North under oath when he was testifying in front of Congress, you know, gives the bullshit that, well, one country in South America falls, you know, becomes communist. When I say falls, I mean falls to communism. And then the rest of the fucking continent is going to fall and they'll all be communist and all of South America. And then they'll have alliances with the Soviet union and Cuba. And I think the Soviet union having that alliance with Cuba in the sixties, and really, I don't know how much of a close alliance it was. I think the Soviet union was trying to fuck with the U S so they approached Cuba who had issues with the U.S. as well. Um, I don't think it's that just because a country's communist, that means that they're going to team up with other communist countries. I think that's a bunch of bullshit. That, well, they're communists, so now they're going to be friends with the Soviet Union. Hey, we're both communists. Let's be friends. No, it, 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 it doesn't work that way. Now, they could offer you know, if they had some use for Nicaragua and supposedly Reagan was worried about American businesses. Well, why do you even have any American businesses in Nicaragua in the first place anyway? And if you're worried about them, then, you know, take them out of Nicaragua. And a lot of this actually, it's funny because I read the book on David Rockefeller and one of the things he was in charge in at, um, I forget which bank he was basically the head of at some one point, but one of the things he did was expand into other countries. And I know he was, uh, a lot allied or 
close with the government or people in the government when he was doing this because what he did was he wanted to give loans to all these third world countries and things like that and that's basically what um the and i can't think of the name of them and they're one of the biggest uh families shit um i'll come back to them but what they did but and what like the world the world bank does is they lend money under certain conditions and then they're able to help control the country and i think that's really what he was into and who knows if he was you know an asset of the cia or some part of the government and that's why he was going out doing that but he was trying to give loans to all of these countries and they wanted to install, of course, central banks in all of these countries as well. But anyway, that was their rationale and why they need to get involved in Nicaragua. And I don't I should have looked up the population. It's not it's not a big country. It's one country in South America. I think there's like 13. And the fact that one country becomes communist. I mean, right now, of course, you have um, Venezuela and what's going on there, which is a mess. But I don't see, well, just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not going on. I don't know that the um, the U.S. is involved with covert operations in Venezuela or not, or what they're you know, I'm sure they have agents in almost every country in the world, to be honest. I mean, that's the empire. It's almost like a secret empire or semi-secret empire. I mean, that's what the United States has developed. And again, I think if another country became a world power and had the assets that the U S has, they'd be doing the same thing. But so Reagan has his whole anti-communist thing. So at first Congress wasn't against it. Also, they promised, as we mentioned earlier, that they were going to sell weapons to Iran. So I think they sold weapons to Iran the first time, but it was supposed to be an ongoing thing. And, So what they came up with, well, initially they didn't come up with anything because they got money from Congress. So the CIA got involved. They got involved in every aspect. And this is why I think the CIA was really running it is what it sounds like. I mean, there's disputes as to, you know, of course, they, uh, Oliver North says, well, the Sandinistas, uh, created the, uh, Contras. We didn't create them. Well, I think they pretty much did. I think you had people that were against them that existed and you had these small groups, but without the U S kind of taking it over, uh, the CIA taking it over, which it seems like that's what they did. I don't think you would have had anything going on there. So initially they were funded by the government and that was fine because, you know, Congress approved it until 1984. They passed the Bolin amendment to stop funding the Contras, I guess due to, uh, they had said, uh, you know, public opinion and things like that. And maybe them just not being on the same page as Reagan. And really, what was the point? Again, um, I, I don't think there was one. But you had the people in the Reagan administration who had that same mentality of, 
okay, we need to stop communism, so we need to continue this. And they got involved in every aspect, training, funding. Um, they merged them into one group. There was actually a leader who had left because he felt like at first, yeah, this is about, you know, the freedom of the people. But then it turned into just the interest of the CIA or the U.S. government. And they were really the ones that seemed to be um, running it. The other thing that the CIA did is they mined the harbors. And when I first heard that, I'm like, what the fuck does that mean? They mined the harbors. They literally put mines around Nicaragua's harbors. Um, and this actually <laughs> comes up later because Barry Seal wanted a, a mine, an anti-mine um, ship or a plane. So it it never really was, I guess, confirmed 100% that Reagan was aware, but there were some documents that essentially from those documents he was in meetings that there's no way that he couldn't have known, although... You know, he's an actor. So when he testified at the hearings, it was I have no rec. I, I remember this vividly when I was a kid. It was I have no recollection. That's pretty much what he said to every question. Um, and then the main guys were, of course, Oliver North is the biggest one that people think of. Admiral Poindexter, which always reminds me of Revenge of the Nerds, Poindexter. And the defense secretary, Casper Weinberger, was involved as well. And I believe, I thought Poindexter might have been sentenced to jail, but never really served any time or served a month or something. Pretty much nothing really happened to any of them, um, anything serious. And of course, Oliver North ended up getting his own show on Fox and he's like their go-to, uh, what do you call it, correspondent when it comes to certain military things. Like, really? That's who you want to go to? And and Fox is against all their hosts are anti-drug. Hannity's like, no, drugs should be illegal because what if somebody does... It, it, this is fucking thinking that idiots like him have. What if somebody does a drug and then commits a crime? Well, you charge them with the crime that they committed. What is it? I don't know. Um, so they had done all that. Um, and as I had mentioned, it was, you know, Reagan worried about, you know, the influence of the Soviet Union and them. It's communism spreading and, of course, the American empire. And I don't know why they'd be worried about that, especially at, you know, 1980. Well, it started in 1980, 81 uh, was when Reagan came in. But, you know, 84 was when the funding got cut off. And why are you going to be worried about that when, at that point, I mean, America is a huge superpower. We're not talking about 1920 or something like that. So... They had already done all these covert operations across the fucking world where they installed all these leaders and all this stuff, and they interfered in everybody's stuff. I mean, every country, um, and they did it, of course, in a way, and I don't know about covert operations, but it, it's they're doing it now in some ways uh, outside of government, like black lives matter is almost a covert operation. Now, if it's connected to the government or not, it may be to be honest, but if they're a communist front and if you read their platform, you could see that And their platform is obviously has nothing to do with 
black people getting killed by police when it mentions global warming and all of this other ridiculous shit. Um, it's, it's an agenda that progressives want to push. So, um, I think this would be a good place to end for today because after this, I want to get into Barry seal and that whole thing. And I don't want to get partially into that and then uh, have to stop. So tomorrow we'll start with Barry Seal, which is a very interesting story. And they made a movie initially with Dennis Hopper that was supposed to be based on his life, but they didn't. I don't believe he was called um, Barry Seal in the movie, but they're making one with Tom Cruise called Mina that's supposed to come out either this year or next year. So, um, and he actually plays Barry Seal. So we'll see um, how that comes out. I mean, and Barry Seal is like a big fat guy too. So I don't know if Tom Cruise is going to, gonna wear like a fat suit for it to look like him or he's just gonna be tom cruise's barry seal like in the nazi movie he played in where he was like the only one without an accent um but i am a tom cruise fan as an actor so so anyway tomorrow we will start with uh barry seal who was a just to give a brief uh description he was the guy who, even before this, he was uh, flying drugs into the U.S. He worked for mostly the Medellin cartel. But at the same time, he was a CIA uh, asset or agent. Um, that's never really been defined. But he did work for the CIA. And he was the one who was flying all of the supplies and weapons to the Contras. And then he'd fly back with a bunch of cocaine. So uh, that was coming from the Medellin cartel, which was Pablo Escobar, the o Ocello brothers, uh, Carlos Later, and um, those guys. And he had this uh, big plane called, I think he called it the Fat Boy. It was a C-123. I don't know a lot about planes, so, but he could fit, you know, he'd fly like 150 to 200 kilos of cocaine into Mina Airport. So, and he was from New Orleans and had started in Baton Rouge, or he was from Baton Rouge and had started there, but they said they wouldn't they kicked him out of there or wouldn't allow him there or something like that. Anyway, he ended up in Mina airport. And once he got there, that's when of course, Bill Clinton who totally denied he had any knowledge of this or anything like that got involved. And that's where it gets into the involvement of Clinton and meetings with Clinton and Bush and Seal, because Bush was the vice president, but again, he was also the former head of the CIA. So he, uh, Bush Sr., was involved in this, and a whole bunch of stuff go on. Uh, the train, what I call the train murders, which I played a clip on, where uh, two teenagers were murdered, but the coroner claimed they were run over by a train because their bodies were just placed there so we'll talk about all that tomorrow and start off with uh barry seal and it should get pretty interesting and for people that don't know about this uh i suggest uh definitely looking into it or listening to the show but not just listening to the show there's documentaries out there um, there's also, you know, books and a lot of information. So this is something that people should know about because it's another example. It's over and over again. And again, it's not the people, it's the institution. And what I'm going to do now, being that we're now a 24 seven, uh, station is actually play uh, and I'll loop them a few documentaries 
that I had found. And I'll also replay the show. I'll add that in there as well. But um, we will play those and you'll be able to listen to it pretty much. There's three documentaries, so um, they'll probably end up playing, you know, three or four times as this will play uh, in a loop up until the uh, the show uh, comes on tomorrow. So um, I'm just actually trying to get this. <laughs> I didn't have it ready and I don't want to have dead air. So um, anyway, for people that aren't aware, on Monday... Ellen Stallone, a seasoned radio veteran at this point. Well, I mean, she's been doing it for a while. She was a co-host on Free Talk Live. She's had three other shows she's worked on, and now she finally has her own show uh, where she is the host. And it airs every Monday at 7 o'clock p.m., you can go back and listen to all the archives. I actually played them uh, earlier this week. We kind of uh, played through all of her shows, again, being that we're 24 hours. And she has a great, unique uh, show. And... I encourage you to at least listen to uh, one of them here. We'll play her commercial uh, real quick while we're, we're getting this together. Are you looking for a podcast that talks about life, the universe, and everything? Listen in to the Illumination Hour, Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. Listen live at Spreaker.com or NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com. We're also on SoundCloud, Spreaker, Twitter, Tumblr, YouTube, and iTunes. The Illumination Hour. Brought to you by Nonpartisan Liberty For All Media and Radio Network. And your host, Ellen Stallone. Because a spark can illuminate the world. So that's all we have for tonight. Again, if you stay tuned uh, to either listen now or just tune in later, they'll be uh, playing over and over until uh, tomorrow's show. And be sure to tune in tomorrow to hear the rest of the show on the Iran-Contra and Mina, Arkansas. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I really appreciate it, and have a good night. And at the end of the day... Each and every member to go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be.